Jesus, we thank you for being so many things to each of us. When we need it, you know exactly what it is. When we need a shoulder to cry on or comfort, encouragement, you're there. When we need correction, you're there. When we need clarity, you're there. Thank you for being all that you are to us. Amen. Have a seat. Mark chapter 15, starting today in verse 21. I will read it, and then we'll reread it and break it down together. Verse 21, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, along with the scribes, mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. I've been reminiscing quite a bit about my ministry and specifically the ministry of this church. And I got back this week into a memory. Do you ever like have something just like come back up and you're like, oh yeah, that that happened. And it was 10 years ago. And Uh, This was right before we had launched our church. I had been kind of setting up my life in a Starbucks. This was back when Starbucks was cool. Um, And now it's like like you got to like drive through and hope they get your name right. But this was back when there was no drive through and it was like the neighborhood Starbucks and everyone was there that you knew. And so I'd be there. I'd be working on, you know, how are we going to launch this church and finding location and working on sermons and training staff. And we always did everything at this, this Starbucks And uh, being there quite often in most of the days, uh, I started to realize that this this particular Starbucks had regulars, like people who were there every morning where they get annoyed if the barista doesn't know their daily order. And there was this one guy, fantastic guy that I've gotten to know over the last decade named Adam. He's kind of this this stocky, bald, kind of disgruntled looking guy. But when you get to know him, he's a softy and he's got great stories, but He's always in line. He gets the same thing every single day, and he knows all the refill rules, so he knows when he's done, he can get his refill and leave. And I'd seen him there. He'd said hello, real friendly, kind of talked to everybody or picked on everybody around him. And so I I, had known about him, and and I didn't really know too much about him, but he knew a little bit about me. Okay, he's starting this church. So fast forward a year, never really hung out with him like one-on-one, quick few conversations. But I did know a little bit about his story. He was not into church at all because growing up, he grew up in a, in a uh, religion that was very controlling of his parents and of his mother specifically, and so he had this kind of chip on his shoulder from his experience and the abuse that him and his family had endured. And so I, I'm walking in one day about a year later. We've already launched the church at this point. He's never come to our church. We don't really talk about church, but I know that about him, and sitting next to him are two people compelling him to hear their story. I know that that is the religion he grew up in, and I know that it's about to explode in my neighborhood Starbucks. And so things start getting a little bit intense, and you can hear the conversation. The baristas are like raising the music a little bit to try to cover some of the the angst that is starting to build up. My palms are sweaty. I'm like, this is not good. And all of a sudden, there he goes. He slides their pamphlet across the table, starts cursing them out, stands up, and he's indignant, and he is angry, and I'm like, oh, dear Lord, please let this just chill out. 
And he starts telling them about his story and what they did to his mother and his family and how he will never, ever listen to them and how they can take their pamphlet and do what they want with it. And he's going off and everyone in Starbucks is staring and he goes, I got a church. In fact, and he points at me in the other side of the Starbucks, that's my pastor. <laughs> and it was like the whole world just came crashing down. I was just getting my Americano. I was there, I was like putting in my headphones so I could maybe avoid any of this whatsoever. And in fact, all eyes in the Starbucks, including the baristas and a few of them with the grin on, stared at me because most of the regulars knew he, I'm not his pastor, but nobody else did. And I remember telling him that day, I said, why did you have to drag me into that whole thing? And he goes, I don't know, but I'll be there on Sunday, I guess, since I told him you're my pastor. He's been twice in the last 10 years. And the reason that that all resurfaced for me is out of the blue this week, he called me, uh, ended up, we ended up having coffee together and catching up, and I just, I told him about that. He said, do you remember that one time? He goes, oh, I, I remember. He goes, in fact, I saw those guys again, and I let him have it. I was like, I'm really glad that time I wasn't there. I think about this story, and I think about just the concept of story in general, and how Mark is telling it. Remember, this is a story that was supposed to be read out loud in a gathering like this all at once. That was their church service to read the whole gospel account of Mark. And this is the crux of the story. This is what it's all been leading up to. Jesus is his ministry and his miracles and his followers and his compassion and his humility and his gentleness and then his trial and his betrayal and now his crucifixion. This is the point in the story where everyone begins to lean in listen, and take in this account. They've all heard that Jesus was crucified. Everyone is here sitting down reading the story. He's heard, oh, they killed that guy from Nazareth. Supposedly he resurrected. But if you're sitting in a gathering while this is being read aloud, this is the moment in our modern day time where the, the score of the movie starts building up and suspense starts coming and you're, you're trying to figure out, is Maverick going to make it out? Or whatever the movie you're watching, how are they going to pull this off? And there is Jesus he is being led to the cross. He has been mocked and beaten. He is so weak, in fact, from his injuries that the Roman soldiers recruit someone that the Bible describes as just passing by. And they bring him into Jesus' story. And it just reminded me of that encounter of being like, I didn't ask to be brought into this. I'm just, well, I'm just here, and all of a sudden you're pointing at me and bringing me into this, this intense moment. And here is this man named Simon of Cyrene. And Cyrene was at the very tip of Africa, modern-day Libya. And he's probably there because Cyrene was a Jewish community. He's probably there to celebrate Passover. He's traveled to Jerusalem, and he's just, Bible describes all three accounts, just passing by. He's in the middle of, of, of this, this mob and this chaotic mess. He's probably asked people, what's going on? He says, well, the Romans are leading him up to the hill. They're going to crucify this guy named Jesus from Nazareth. And so he probably leans in, hasn't been to Jerusalem in a while, and looks over, and there it is. Somebody's pointing at him through the crowd, a Roman soldier who they all fear, and says, hey, you, you're going to carry Jesus' cross for a few reasons. Number one, Jesus is weak, but number two, Roman soldiers were commissioned to carry out this crucifixion, and if Jesus dies before they're able to crucify him, they're going to be in trouble. So we're going to make sure that Jesus gets all the way to that hill and gets nailed to that cross so that we can have accomplished our mission and we don't get in trouble. So you, sir, Simon, whatever your name is, come on over here. You're going to bear the burden, the cross beam of this cross and carry it up to the hill called Golgotha so that we can accomplish our goal of killing this Man, he is being pointed out in a Starbucks and being called out and brought into a story he has no idea about, and now he is part of one of the greatest stories of all time. He's being dragged into a moment that he had no expectation of, no desire of, but his story, I'm just here for Passover, I'm just traveling to Jerusalem, all of the sudden... He gets grafted into somebody else's story, a beautiful story. In fact, the story everyone in the first century is sitting down in a house church listening to, this story of Jesus of Nazareth, all that he's done, and everything is coming to this crux moment, and he's called in there. Hey, you, you're going to finish carrying this cross up to the hill. So they compel, the Bible uses this word, they compelled him. In other words, 
He had no option. It wasn't like, hey, does anybody want to carry Jesus' cross? No, it was, hey, you, you're coming, you're doing this. The Roman soldiers had supreme authority in the land. He is just passing through, and he goes from being a spectator to a participant in the crucifixion of Jesus. One author put it this way. She said, every story whispers his name, speaking of Jesus. He is like the missing piece in a puzzle, that piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. I don't know what your story and Jesus is, but I know that I can look at the ways and the moments and the seasons of my life as I follow Jesus, where all of a sudden he just like grabs me into a story. Like, I wasn't planning on doing this or meeting them or being friends with them or whatever it was. All of a sudden, Jesus is like, you are now a part of this story. You, you were just traveling to Jerusalem. You're just passing through. You're, you're just going about your business. Maybe it was a religious routine or a practice. Maybe it was curiosity, or maybe he was there uh, on the behest of someone else, or he was just there to help someone else along, but he gets brought into this moment, brought into this story, and we find out later that in the first century, one of the biggest um, communities of the Christian faith that seemed to have exploded was starting in the Jewish community of Cyrene at the tip of Africa. Like something significant has happened here. Jesus is in the middle of his crucifixion. God in his sovereignty is orchestrating something to where one single man who we've never heard of in scripture before and never hear about again is grafted into this story for all three synoptic gospels to mention him by name. Simon of Cyrene. Men... Mark does something different than the other gospel writers. He mentions his children. He says, they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. Then he says this, the father of Alexander and Rufus to carry his cross. Now, we don't hear about Simon ever again, but we do hear about a guy named Rufus. He was one of the leaders, one of the participants, one of the people in the church that was set up in Rome And we know that Mark wrote this gospel primarily for Roman listeners, for the Roman churches. And so I don't know which church setting or which house setting or which gathering he was in, but someday they get together in that first century and their their leader of their community gets up and reads the gospel account of Mark from beginning to end. And there as everything begins to well up and as the story begins to climax and as things are getting exciting and scary and terrifying and as the story takes this twist, Simon of Cyrene is mentioned, and just a little cliff note, that's Rufus's dad. And it was like something, for whatever reason, by God's sovereignty and the inspiration of Scripture, Mark wrote down, that's Rufus's dad. So that as if, it was as if people who heard it were like an immediate connection. Oh, it's not just a story, this obscure thing where other people were involved. It was Rufus's dad. Imagine Rufus being in church that day, how embarrassing that must have been. Like you're sitting there in church and you're fine and I do this to you guys all the time because anything you say or do to me can and will be used against you in a sermon illustration. <laughs> so I imagine Rufus is sitting there, he's hanging out, brought a couple of his friends to church that day. The pastor is reading the book of Mark and then he goes, yeah, that's Rufus's dad. And everybody's like, you? Like that Rufus? He's like, yeah, that's my dad, you know. But immediately, what I believe Mark is trying to do is get his hearers, to get the listeners of this story to realize that this is not just a story. This is an account. This is real. This actually happened. Because all other religions and all of their other life has always been based on the verbal translation of Scripture. This is what happened to Moses, and this is what happened to Elijah, and it was just passed down for generations. And so eventually, Moses and Elijah and David, they kind of become these mythical ideals that that they don't have any connections to. And then there is this Jesus who is very recent in his story, and Mark saying, no, this isn't just a story, this obscurity or this nice myth. This myth is a myth because it's beautiful, but it's also true. And Rufus can tell you that his dad was there. Side note, kind of a cool idea. Rufus's name means red. And as this story unfolds, I wonder if, Simon choosing his son's name might have been influenced by 
this encounter of Jesus marred and beaten and bleeding on a cross and what transformation might have taken place. Some scholars would venture to say that Simon of Cyrene was one of the first commissioned gospel-telling people in Africa. That everything that happened in that moment stuck with him to such a degree that he would name his son the color red and then tell the world what he experienced. So they get to the top of the hill and they offer Jesus, verse 23, wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. If you're a good note taker or a mental note taker, remember that timestamp because next week we'll realize how long this process took. And the inscription of the charge read against him was the king of the Jews. The Romans were a violent kind of people, especially the soldiers. They found the most intense ways to torture, to kill, to enact pain upon people. And crucifixion was amongst the most brutal ways to die. And with them being as violent and as harsh as they were, there was this, always this little kind of grain of compassion that went along with crucifixion. They would offer the one sentenced to death, a bit of wine mixed with something that might salve the pain or at least alleviate some of the mental stress that they're about to encounter. You're about to have stakes driven through your arms and your legs. You're about to be basically suffocating in your own blood as you asphyxiate on this cross. And so we're going to give you just a little bit of wine, just a little bit of myrrh to take away what you are about to experience. So they offer him the cup of wine mixed with myrrh, and Jesus refuses to drink it. It's as if Jesus is saying, I will suffer every drop of the cup my Father has poured for me. I don't need your cup of wine. I already have one. I'm not, I'm going to have this full experience. I'm going to take all of this for what it is in my humanity, all of the pain, all of the anguish, all of the suffering. I'm going to endure it all. I'm not going to take any single shortcuts. I already have my cup. I did beg for this cup to pass for me just last night in the garden, but I didn't pass for me, and I told my father that I would do what he wants me to do and drink what he gives me to drink, and right now, that's suffering. And that part of Jesus' story can be pivotal, pivotal to the way you and I experience hardship in our life. Because my knee-jerk reaction to pain, suffering, the indifference of others, or being maligned from the outside is always to try to find a salve, always to try to numb pain or avoid pain or skirt around the obstacle or the issue. But God has given us our lot in this life, and if you try to numb pain in our day and age, it's real easy to do it, right? A quick trip to the liquor store and you can have a, a pretty numb night. Our culture is, 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 is filled with ways to escape reality at all costs, and Jesus refuses to do it because this is what God has given him to do. If you and I want to be like Jesus in the midst of suffering or pain or hardship, we have to choose to endure what God has handed us without trying to find ways to escape it, without trying to find ways to avoid it or skirt around it. Jesus says, I don't. I don't need that cup. What I have and what's being handed to me right now was destined before I ever arrived. And it is this pain and this suffering is for the benefit of everyone I know, everyone on this earth. Verse 34, calling the crowd, um, uh, Mark 8, verse 34, calling the crowd to join his disciples, Jesus said this, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. This is before his crucifixion. So preemptive, such a foreshadow of what Jesus is going to endure at the cross, what we're reading today. This is is in uh, eight chapters before, six chapters before. He says, follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, 
the saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? And what could you ever trade your soul for? Jesus has already laid it out for his disciples before his crucifixion. To follow me means taking the path that I take, and the path that I'm about to take is a steep climb up a hill where I get crucified. And if you want to follow Jesus to his disciples, and I believe to you and I today, even 2,000 years later, is that we are not signing up for a perfect life. We're not signing up for an easy life. We're not signing up for a life that is not complicated or not complex. We are signing up to follow Jesus for a life that is most likely, at least on this side of heaven, an uphill battle full of pain and heartache and disappointment. And the temptation, I believe, Jesus is laying out for his disciples before the cross and laying out for us is you're going to want to try to avoid it. But it is in that pain and in that suffering and through that endurance that I will form you and, and, and forge you into who I want you to be and who you were always meant to be. Verse 27 of 15 again. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, this is like an I got you moment. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also, check this. This is where it gets real intense. The chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Even after they've supposedly won, Jesus is hanging on a cross. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the chief priests are still demanding a sign from Jesus. If you are truly the Son of God, show us a sign. And then when he doesn't, they have him killed, and on the cross they ask him the same question. Just show us a sign. It speaks to how indifferent they were, how hard-hearted they were, how spiritually blind they were, the men entrusted by God to make a way for the Messiah once again completely miss him. And T. Wright put it this way. He said, in the crucifixion, we witness the collision of divine holiness and human brokenness, resulting in redemption and restoration of relationship with God. We are watching In real time, if you're listening to this story for the first time in the first century, you're watching the evilness of man and the sin of man and and their, their despising of Jesus colliding with his humility and his love and his compassion and his patience and his willingness to sacrifice himself. And he's still on the cross. They've got what they've wanted. And look, see? He's not the Messiah. He's just... A man. It's like confirmation bias, right? You've set up a situation in by which whatever you believe can now be confirmed. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Son of God. He's not what he says he is. In fact, let's nail him to a cross, and then we'll find out if he really can do whatever he wants. It's like you've set up this scene to only confirm what you believe, and you've missed God's Son. And the most wild part, they're making fun of the humanity of Jesus. Look, he's suffering. Look, he's dying. He can't even come down from the cross. He can't even come away from that. He can't even save himself. Look at that. They're they're making a mockery of his humanity, but it was Jesus' humanity and his real suffering on the cross that actually brings about the redemption of all people. They're making fun of what he came to actually do. Because Jesus doesn't operate like you and I. We always want the way out. Just come down. Jesus goes through. He goes through the cross. In his book, The Day the Revolution Began, Wright once again says this, the crucifixion is the climax, not not only of Jesus' story, but of God's plan of redemption. 
where Jesus' death becomes the ultimate expression of God's love and of justice. Listen to what Paul tells the church uh, in Colossians chapter 1. He says this. It's a beautiful writing. I'm going to read it out of Eugene Peterson's translation because the way he says it sits really well in my spirit. He says this. Speaking of Jesus, he was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From the beginning to the end, he's there, towering above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood, that poured down from the cross. For the people who are hearing this story of Mark for the very first time, everything they presupposed about Jesus was, yeah, I heard he died and I heard about that. But now this story is different. It's as if this isn't just an occasion or an event that happened to Jesus. This is the event that God has orchestrated for everyone. This this moment of crucifixion wasn't just simply, oh yeah, that guy was great and he did miracles and I want to hear about him and he had some great things to say. No, this is the crux of our faith. Without the crucifixion, there is no Christianity. Without the crucifixion and the resurrection... Christ is nobody because he doesn't fulfill what he says he'll do unless he does die like he said he'd die and rise like he said he would rise. The crucifixion was everything. It is everything that God in flesh would set aside his attributes, set aside his power, lay his life down for our freedom. The earliest depictions of the Christian faith were actually a mockery. It would be a donkey on a cross, uh, hung, and it was the way that the Romans and the Greeks would would make fun of Christianity. Your your Jesus, he was a donkey, he was a jackass. It was a joke. Look at him on a cross, and they would depict him on a cross with with the head of a donkey. And eventually we realized through our faith and through the study of Scripture and through the illumination of the the disciples and the apostles who wrote the New Testament that this wasn't just something we should be made fun of about. That Jesus himself on the cross is everything to us. The cross, the original symbol, was to be made fun of us and now it is the symbol of our faith. We owned it. You can make fun of us, you can mock us, you can can make little of the cross, but the cross is, is everything. Scott McKnight put it this way, he says, Through the crucifixion, Jesus entered into the darkest aspects of the human experience, identifying with our suffering and opening the way for transformation. Everything begins in your faith at the cross. And then there's Simon. He's just walking by like, I don't know if you are like me, but sometimes I'm like, God, give me a sign. I'm like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests. I'm like, okay, if you are who you really are, Jesus, do this in my life or do this to my finances or help me in my relationships or do this in the business or whatever it is. And I'm like, God, give me that sign. And that sign doesn't come, but there is still the cross. Like the sign, I want, I want you to do something. No, but there's still the cross. And that cross is the sign of God's love. They're asking us, show us that you're God. He is. He's stretched out with a love so expansive and magnanimous and revolutionary and counterintuitive that God would die, would live as a human. The one who spoke the universe into existence and be stretched out on a cross for you and I. What a powerful display. I imagine Simon gets to the top of the hill He carries this heavy cross and he sets it down and the Roman soldiers nail Jesus to it and stick him in the ground. And a lot of the depictions we have in our minds is that he's like 40 feet in the air, right? And everybody's looking up at Jesus. They would crucify people at eye level on the roadside so that everyone passing by could look them in the eye and see the suffering. And next to him would be the inscription, Jesus King of the Jews, his crime, his only crime against Rome and the church was his true identity. That he is being crucified, not for what he said 
for what he did, but for who he is. And I imagine they crucify him, and Simon's still standing by like, what did I just get roped into? Why are there so many people here? And next week we'll cover it, but there are tons of people following Jesus to the cross, some to mock him, to revile him, but his followers are there too. Mary and, and, and others are, are, are all gathered and they're watching that their, their friend and their loved one and their child is being crucified. And he's got to be wondering, what is the big deal? Rome crucifies people all the time. Why is this so significant? And imagine being at eye level with the crucified Jesus. Like how real and raw Imagine you're standing there and you carry the cross. You've got to be winded. You're not sure if you're allowed to leave yet. They're nailing him to to pieces of wood through his hands and his feet. The crown of thorns is still fixed on his head. They've shoved a spear in his side. They're trying to shove wine and myrrh down his throat. They're casting lots for his clothes and the people they crucified next to him on his right and his left, even in their death, begin to joke about Jesus too. People are spitting and mocking, they're walking by and, and throwing a few punches and kicking and, and, and they're, they're brutalizing this Jesus. And there is Simon going, what did I just get dragged into? What am I actually experiencing? Something significant is taking place because I don't know if you've ever seen like an open gaping wound, but that stuff sticks in your mind for a long time, Right? Like, you're like, that was a brutal car accident, or that was a brutal moment, or, oh, look at this scar. I remember when that happened. There was blood everywhere. Something is ingrained into his memory and his experience, so much so that he begins to ask people around him, what did he do? Who is this guy? What's going on? And he gets the full story, and he watches Jesus die on a cross, and then he goes back home, and he tells everyone, I wasn't even planning for this. This wasn't in my agenda. It wasn't on my vacation itinerary in Jerusalem. I was just walking by, and all of a sudden I'm getting roped into this grand, beautiful story of God's redemptive plan for humanity. And he looks Jesus in the eye, and I have it in me to believe that something significant happens in the life of Simon of Cyrene. Rufus' dad was changed forever. If you and I keep the story of Jesus as this idea, this myth, this ancient story that doesn't have any connection to us, and we don't enter and allow God to grab us into his story, graft us into this story, we will never see Jesus face to face. you got to look him in the eye as he's sacrificing and laying down his life, accomplishing the will of his father, denying a cup from man to drink the cup from his father. You have to experience that. And I I just believe that the story of the crucifixion and why it's so graphic and detailed in every single gospel account is so that you and I can understand it's it's not Sunday school anymore. My little girl went to a VBS at a, I think it was a Nazarene church, all my kids got saved at a Nazarene VBS this summer. And uh, they come home with the cards. I gave my life to Jesus. And I'm like, okay, what does this mean? And, and, and she goes, Jesus died for our sins. And yes, it's true and it's so elementary, but it's also graphic and real and brutal and extreme. And the word pictures that are being painted all throughout Scripture are there to describe for us the reality of Jesus' sacrifice. The the size of it, the impact of it, it had such an impact on a guy they roped into the story that he named his kid Red. Like, what in your life has been so ingrained that you experienced, that's so inside of you that it's impacted the way you've seen the world for the rest of it? For Simon, it was this crucifixion. Paul goes on to say to the church in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, he says, you yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over 
to God's side. Just like Simon, you're being grafted into a story here and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust constantly tuned into the message, the story. Careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message. Just this one. Every creature under heaven gets the same message. And I, Paul, am a messenger of this message. I know this isn't like what we like in American church. I want to go to church on Sunday. I want, to, I want them to sing a couple of my favorite songs. And if they could repeat that bridge I like, I'll sing along too. And I hope they have good coffee and hopefully the kids' ministry's got it together. And, and if I get there early enough, I can get my parking spot. And then the pastor will make me feel good and we'll all go home. And then you get to passages like this and it doesn't really feel good. We are talking about our hero dying. We're talking about God in flesh. This, this, we've gone over for the last like 18 months this story of all the beautiful things Jesus does. And now we stand at eye level on a roadside after being roped in and he is being crucified. And he's not even recognizable he is so beaten. He can barely breathe. New Testament Scholars tell us the graphicness of crucifixion was that they actually had to nail their feet into the cross because it was the only way they could get leverage to breathe. That, that after your body and your plural, plural spaces are being filled with blood and fluid and after you're, he's, been, he's been flogged and beaten, that, that he's so inflamed that breathing is nearly impossible. So to give them leverage, they would, they would crucify them with their feet to, so they could lift just a little bit and now allow their, their, their abdomen to expand and to breathe. Like, we're talking suffering to a degree that most of us cannot comprehend, and he is there at eye level. And they are they're throwing dice to see who gets his cloak. And the chief priests and the scribes who pretty much put him there in the first place are still saying, look at you, man. His mom and his disciples, friend John, are in the crowd, and they're watching their friend, their child, their healer, their savior die. We're talking about a moment for his followers where everything they think they know is crashing down on top. We thought he was going to... Imagine Peter, he just denied him the night before. He probably in that crowd looking, going, he's got to come down. Jesus, we've seen you do all kinds of crazy stuff, man. I saw you like transfigured with Moses and Elijah. Like you, you turned water into the best wine. You brought that little girl back from the dead. You can serve Jesus. Just show them. Just, just show them. Prove to them. I know you can do it. But he rejects that cup and drinks the one his father gave him. And the best part of the story, and quite honestly, the worst part of the story, was that was my cup. And that's your cup. That was the cup I'm supposed to drink. All the things that I've done, all the people I've hurt, all the evil in my heart, that's the cup for me. And Jesus rejects the cup that I would have ran to and drinks my cup that his father gave him. And he drinks your cup. And he drinks your neighbor's cup. And he drinks your enemy's cup. And he drinks your in-law's cup. And he drinks everybody's cup. And it's the best part of the story because this is where heaven and earth begin to collide. The cross is not the sad part. The cross is the coronation. They put a crown of thorns, but they don't even know. This is the moment in the story where the true king crowns where we all get to realize, looking our Savior, not up on a hill, but at eye level, you would do that for me? 
No, I don't plan on having any more children. Please, Lord. I don't really know the timeline, but I really like to believe that Simon named his kid Red just because of that. And maybe you're not going to name your child like blood or anything crazy. (laughs) But I think we can look at our life in a whole new way, right? If he would do that for me, then whatever he asks and whatever cup he pours, I'll drink. And whoever he puts in my life, however he grafts me into different stories or the story of of the grand story of the gospel, however he wants to use me in it, I'll do it. He said, he said if you want to follow me, you've got to be able to be willing to pick up a cross. Simon never even heard that sermon, and he's picked up a cross, and he's following Jesus, and he's like, I don't know what's going on, but this is about to change the way I see the world, my children, my life forever. And when you encounter not the meme Jesus, not the caricature Jesus, not this depiction, this this blue-eyed, blonde-haired, sweet Jesus with a purple sash and a bunch of naked babies around him. I'm talking about like when you meet the real Jesus and you look him at eye level in his suffering, in his pain, in his full expression of humanity, as he dies and he drinks that cup, I can promise you this, you will never be the same. You will never see the world the same way And that story that you just got roped into, just pulled in from, will change you. And if Jesus has his way, it'll change people around you. Something that significant doesn't fall away. Can I pray for us and maybe give us a moment to reflect before we close in song? Jesus, this is the part of the story where if we were there, we were hoping that something, something miraculous would take place. You just come down from the cross. You just show them who you really are. For those of us who know the end of the story, we, if we're being honest, God, sometimes we skip over this part right to the resurrection. Thank you for not drinking from that cup. Thank you for not escaping that cross. Thank you for drinking what was mine and ours. You said it yourself, Jesus. You said that that greater love has no man than this, than someone would lay down their life for their friend. Would you impress upon us like you did Simon of Cyrene? We've been grafted into this story. We don't even know why we're, we're sitting in... We're sitting in a, in, a, in a hot white room in Corrales 2,000 years later. We're not even really sure how we got here, but you roped us in. You grabbed us. You gave us this story. We want to look you in the eyes as you are crucified for us and realize that if we can grasp this, we'll never be the same. We may not name our kids Rufus or Red, but God, let it have such an impact on our lives that every day is different. Every situation brings about a new perspective. Help us to learn to lay down our lives for the people around us. Our agendas, our plans, our beliefs, our ideals, our politics, so that others could benefit. We're just going to take a moment. I don't know who you are in this story. Paul says that we were all the scribes and Pharisees in the, in, the, in the story originally, running from him, denying him, rejecting him. Maybe you're going through suffering. Maybe you're just asking for another cup to drink from. Maybe you're running to another cup to drink from, just to numb the pain, numb the loneliness. Jesus already drank from the cup. You don't need a drink from it, too. You're reaching for a check that he already paid for. Let it change you and transform you. Let it shape the way you look at the world, your spouse, your kids. Let it impact your community, your coworkers, your neighbors. 
Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He drank from a cup that we all deserve. And that cross changes everything. God, we're just going to give you a minute to speak to us. If you want to comfort someone, do it. Your spirit come down, bring them comfort. For some of us, we just need to remember the gravity of the cross. Let that sink in. Brothers, we're just, this life, it just feels like I have my agenda and I'm going to where I'm supposed to go, but you're grabbing us out of that agenda. You're grabbing us out of the itinerary of our lives and you're roping us into this story and we're not exactly sure how it's all going to unfold, but, but we're willing. Teach us, show us, reveal to us what that looks like. Most of all, let this be a moment where we just show you our gratitude. Thank you, Jesus, for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves.